Okay, great. So as Karthik mentioned, we are going to be talking about how we are going to get to the next million users here um, in our space in Ethereum and blockchain and crypto in general. So again, my name is Karen Scarborough. And what I'd like to do is allow each of our panelists up here to give a brief introduction of their project and what they're working on. And also, if you can help define what success and user adoption means in your particular space, I think that'd be a great place to start. So. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily Coleman, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Shapeshift. And we are a digital asset exchange platform. Um, we've been around since 2014, and we've gone through you know, quite, a, quite a few different uh, changes over the last few years of creating different types of products uh, and really pulling people more into the financial side, which I think was kind of that first crypto use case. So we've been really focusing on as far as like what we see as success coming from that financial sector and creating those kinds of things as how do we allow that, that customer journey to be easier to navigate and put things into one space for them? You know, we, we find that people who are just trying to, to utilize, there we go, can you hear me? <laughs> we find that people that are, are trying to just utilize any sort of financial side of this, they tend to have to use a lot of different systems to do what they want to do. So really that success for us moving forward is how do we make that user experience a lot more streamlined and easier to do? Uh, my name is Lily Liu. Uh, I'm an angel investor uh, and uh, largely within crypto. Uh, last year, we sold Earn.com to Coinbase, um, and uh, and so you know one thing I think a lot about is how you take aspects of cryptocurrency um, and make it applicable to millions, hundreds of millions, ideally you know uh, uh, billions of people in the world. I'm Nabil. Um, I work on the operations side at Status. Um, Status is a mobile application that has a DApp browser, a wallet, and a uh, chat. It's basically a decentralized WeChat. Uh, mass adoption for Status basically looks like, um, you know, millions, if not billions, of people using Status to be able to access the decentralized web. So all the applications that are getting built here, everything that we call Web3 or DApps are accessed through this mobile application. Hi, I'm Marguerite. I'm the CEO of Blockade Games. Uh, we're focused basically on blockchain gaming and targeting mainstream users. Uh, we're stripping out all the complexity that you might have today with having a third-party wallet or, um, or understanding what cryptocurrency even is and just focusing on the gameplay experience. Uh, my background, I've if you've heard of crypto puzzles, uh, I go by the handle of Coin Artist, and since 2014, I've been playing around with with crypto and gaming experiences. So naturally, it just led to launching this game company about a year ago. Excellent. Okay, so the first thing I want to bring up is that we have an incredible amount of developer talent within this community, and that's been growing the foundations of what we have. But how else can we use other skill sets available to help grow user adoption as we move forward? Um, I, I actually think about this a lot because as a marketer, I know that there isn't, there aren't a lot of marketers, and I know traditionally in tech a lot of times that is seen as kind of a secondary part of when you're developing, especially nascent, new, high, you know, high tech. So a lot of the, a lot of that though comes into this realm of people just being really scared. Like I know marketers that I know that are very talented coming from different worlds, even in finance, there is a little bit of a fear of, do I belong there? Will I be accepted? Will I ever understand this? And I came from a completely different sector. I was in hospitality tourism and I had those same fears, but I also had, I joined a company where, you know, our CEO and, and everyone who was around me was helping me. They didn't make me feel like it wasn't doable for me to get there. So I do think it is a lot about, you know, we use this term inclusivity and bringing people in, which is a big part of on the, you know, the ethos side of this industry. We talk about that a lot. I would really push all of us to start living that a bit more and bringing anyone in. I was out at the food truck today and a guy came up to me and he was, we were chit chatting and he comes, he is in the medical field and he's like, I'm, I'm trying to like figure out how I get in this. And we had a little bit of talk about it and I brought that point up. I'm like, you actually have background in things that could be very interesting and usable here. 
And he, he was like, I didn't really think about it that way. So how do we should help people identify how they can be part of this ecosystem and bring their talents in that might not be technological. And that's not, is that the most important thing? We have a lot of developers. We need to continue to grow that. But I think biz dev, marketers, communicators, people coming from different sectors that this can solve solutions for them to feel like they can be a part of the ecosystem is really important too. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think that uh, we focus so much in, in, is, in the industry on sort of new uh, technological kind of advancements. Uh, and sometimes I feel like we should talk more about why this stuff is useful to hundreds of millions of people. Um, rather than you know talking about uh, sort of incremental technology and how that's really cool, but for what is usually the other side of the conversation, which I wish we would talk about a little bit more. Um, what I think is lacking a little bit right now is, frankly, a very simple reason for why hundreds of millions of people should care. Uh, and I think that narrative um, uh, needs to be much simpler. Um, and I think the use cases around that need, need to be much simpler as well. Um, I don't think that censorship resistance um, is a narrative that has broad appeal beyond the people who are kind of in it right now. I think there are versions of that narrative which actually do, for lack of a better word, sort of sell more broadly. So instead of talking about censorship resistance and privacy, uh, maybe we should be talking more sort of consistently about freedom and security, right? Uh, because censorship resistance and privacy sound like you have something to hide and like you're running away from something. Freedom is something that is aspirational. Um, I would argue is like a set of values that has sort of proliferated Western culture more broadly than any other sort of value system out there uh, in kind of, you know, the realm of governments and nation states. And then privacy also sounds like you have something to hide and you're up to no good, where security and safety um, is something that everyone can understand because of course everyone has a lock on your front door. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're sort of doing something illegal, illegal behind that locked door, right? So I think that first that narrative has to shift, otherwise it sounds like, uh, you know, this kind of corner of, you know, crazy, crazy people on the internet. Um, and, and then I think that the value proposition, why you should be using this, also needs to just be much simpler, whether it's gaming or, you know, whether, whether it's something uh, even broader than that that we haven't imagined. Yeah, I think Lily, those excellent points. And I just reflecting on status being positioned as a secure and censorship resistant messaging application is very much pigeonholing it to like snowed in aficionados and people like that, right? It's a very closed and narrow way of looking at this technology. Um, I, I also think to follow on from what you said, there's markets that are not Western Europe and North America that would greatly be, you know, use this technology not framed in, in that same way. So you have Latin America, which we can see is adopting crypto at crazy rates. The, the, te the technology and tools that we're building, how can we use that to benefit people, right? And um, there is a tendency to, especially at events like this, for us to build for ourselves, build for the community. And we need to look and see where can this, the tools that we're building are very powerful and who is the audience that can actually benefit from this. And let's go and build for those people. And how can then, how can then we communicate those features to those people? So there's there's multiple layers here for us to start thinking about mass adoption. Sure. Um, one of your points about like the tech keeps going so deep into the security, and that's hard for maybe a a user walking into our space, and they want to be excited about cryptocurrency, but then people are throwing around you know, plasma cash and like, what is that? A, is that a currency? And they get confused pretty quickly. But then if you were to roll out an application that just had your, you know, sign up with your email and you have a password and now it's an application that has, it's a game and you're learning to play a game. And then there's a point where you realize those game assets are valuable and you can do something else with them. But the blockchain experience has been completely like hidden in the back end. And you didn't even need to advertise that it's blockchain. Right? It's like users get excited about the functionality and the utility of, of the tokens being like a, a liquid game asset. Like that really hasn't happened yet. So I'm excited to see uh, once we introduce to mainstream gamers what you can do with this technology, then what happens? Uh, um, I think that uh, you know the, the applications, I'm glad that more and more people are thinking about applications in ways that millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people can touch this technology. 
but kind of my, uh, my kind of reflection on some of these cases that have been articulated so far, um, it's certainly evolved, but I feel like, you know, if you remember last year, um, there were, you know, a number of these sort of, oh, you know, let's do a decentralized Uber, decentralized marketplace, because then you save 25%. But to me, that was just never really good enough because 25% is what gets me to buy from Best Buy instead of Target, right? That's not going to onboard me into an entirely new infrastructure, an entirely new sort of world. Um, and so I thought that to me, you know, since everyone talks about crypto like the beginning of the internet, uh, that to me was saying, okay, you know, the internet's going to be great for information now because now we can take a PDF of the newspaper and put it online, right? Which is better than getting like a soggy newspaper on your doorstep, but it's not really that innovative and it's not really that game changing. Okay, great. So thankfully we're sort of beyond that um, for the most part. Uh, and now a lot of people are really into sort of blockchain meets gaming, which I think is better uh, and is, it is certainly going to be here for the long run. But to me it's a little bit like, okay, now it's not a PDF of the newspaper. Now it's kind of like nytimes.com, right? It is to an extent digitally native, but it is not imagining all the things that you can use with sort of truly native information creation consumption uh, uh, experiences that you get with social media, that you get with blogging, that you get so on and so forth. And I think that's kind of the class of, um, of uh, interactions or applications that hopefully we're going to be imagining in the future, because I think it's just going to look very unlike the way people currently interact with value and assets on the internet. I think it was good that we touched on a lot of vocabulary that doesn't necessarily translate into other areas because it kind of brings us into other questions around the, the core difference of what's happening in this space. So one of the questions that falls along that line um, that comes to mind is that as we scale and recognize that that's a real challenge, how do you balance that priority with more user adoption while maintaining the same end goal without making compromises? Yeah, I mean, I think that is actually, that's the next challenge, I think, for the entire industry is we've all been building, uh, you know, amazing engineers, especially the Ethereum community. You have, so, this is the larger, the largest uh, development community that we have within the entire blockchain ecosystem. And so there's a lot of really amazing things being built and everyone's been so focused on building for themselves. I mean, I think Lily touched on this a moment ago. We, we keep building for ourselves instead of for the customer. And with that, when we do that, then we start feeling like to get, we start going into this rabbit hole of, they have to understand all this terminology. They have to understand all these things in order to be able to use our products. And that's actually not really the reality of, and I guess it depends on how are we going to define who our customer segments are as well. If we do define that it is the more technical users, which for Shapeshift that's not necessarily the case, then I can see where you would, where you would maybe ha find some more priority of educating on terminology and how it functions. But if you do define your customer base, um, you know, through that, and I think all of us have touched on gamification aspects. If we do want to make their user journey really easy and seem and streamlined, then it's not about them learning about blockchain technology or the terminology. It's about them being able to use something and not even knowing that layer exists. All they know is that it functions better and it does these things, it solves these problems they always wanted to be solved. So, um, but again, it is, it is a lot about, a lot more about, um, you know, the whole concept of mental modeling as well of how, what do they know how to interact with at this current time and how do we create products that kind of align with the things they already know how to use and, and help them along that learning journey without throwing very scary technical jargon and making them feel like they have to be a technologist to be involved. Uh, so we recently released uh, a proof of concept called Plasma Bears, and it does do what I mentioned before with just putting in your email and password. And it's proving our assumptions that the uh, three components of social gaming, um, asset ownership, and speculation can drive a pretty um, healthy feedback loop for acquiring users and virality. In the past three weeks, our users minted on our side chain over 100,000 NFTs. And to us, that is, so we're doing two times the transactions that CryptoKitties is right now. So they, it's, it doesn't cost you anything, there's no gas fees. You just get to in, interact with the application and you have the non-fungible token. And then when you, we just opened up the gateway, so you'll be able to make those transfers to the mainnet for your first crypto if you wanna trade. But like the onboarding experience, even if you go to the site, it doesn't say blockchain. 
it, and it's supposed to be made in a way where the social like virality, I can email you a non-fungible token. I can, I can put on like a claim link on your Twitter account. So that user acquisition is always important. And I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of products are missing is that it's al like always acquiring users. Great. Okay, well, following along that, um, just a, a quicker question. What do you think the top misconceptions there are still out there about entering into this space or using the applications that have been developed and are um, growing at this point? Well, the top mis misconceptions about, um, uh, well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, we've moved beyond um, this whole narrative of uh, Bitcoin being drug money. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think that that is, uh, but I think that that kind of within the mainstream um, is still a little bit more present than, um, than you know, us within the ecosystem would, uh, would understand. So I think that, uh, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, I think that uh, the narrative around, um, around uh, privacy re needs to be rebranded as something, as uh, the importance of digital security. Uh, I think that's still one of the misconceptions that if you want to have privacy on the internet, it's because you're up to no good, right? Uh, and that's like saying, hey, you know, you should keep your front door wide open because otherwise, how do I know you're not engaging in, in you know, some illicit activity back there? Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think as well, um, generally, you know, blockchain is very much attributed to currency speculation for the vast majority of people. So like, you know, if I have family ask me what I do, I'm like, do I tell, like, I work in cryptocurrency. Oh, you work for Bitcoin. You're like, sure, fine. <laughs> um, so that, yeah. that misconception, which once again comes back to language around yeah. blockchain versus what's Bitcoin versus this. It's like, well, don't worry about that. And maybe Web3 is the answer, like who knows? But there, the huge misconception is this whole space is about currency speculation and people making money. Like, I mean, if I can push back against that, I actually don't think that's a misconception. I think that's the reality. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of people in this space try to push back against that and say, you know, engage in willful ignorance by saying, oh, I don't want to talk about price. But that to me is kind of a funny thing because in cryptocurrency, this is all about incentivization. Without price, you don't have incentives. And then the whole kind of, you know, uh, and the incentives is, is what fundamentally drives this, this distributed ecosystem. So I think that, um, you know, the simple reality is that people are here because they want to make money online. And that today, in the form of this heavily, this highly risky asset class with very little fundamental value, um, that is how people have been making money off of speculation. Um, and I think that's just kind of natural part and parcel. And so to me, that kind of points longer term that if there are, is going to be, you know, the next million, 100 million people coming into this space, it has to be because they feel like they can make money online, i.e. it has to be about income generation. And maybe not a speculative form as it, as it is today, but that's where I hope sort of the ideas are going to be formed around, which is, um, which is it has to be about making money in one way, one way or another. So I, I think that's a, that's a bit of an extreme like, case that the next 100 million coming onto this platform are going to want to make money because real utility, you need something that will make end consumer sticky. And if you, if you think that there's a financial incentive for users to come on board, then this whole room is a giant affiliate marketing. Like, I, I, we need to have utility beyond financial. And, and I can see from a developer perspective the incentives there to create utilities for your token, but that's orthogonal to utility for end users of why this technology is important, from, from my perspective. It's, it's good. It starts a good conversation of if it's not a financially driven motivation, what other kind of connections would there need to be in order to facilitate more user adoption? Yeah, I mean, I think that's when we, you know, Marguerite brings up what she's doing here on like really upping, not just gamification as a concept, but like really getting into the game playing. And we already, you know, we, as a society that has been using tech for decades now, we already actually use a lot of the things that um, techno the blockchain technology can actually be a layer of the functionality. And I, I think, Lily, you're right, to an extent, so far, it, it has been seen as just kind of a, a financial vehicle. But I think going to the next million, we actually do need to have a lot more conversations about what does it look like to actually 
separate cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and blockchain from each other and define them as different entities, even though they, they, they work together, they can be explained holistically. To your point, I don't know how many people ask me, oh, you're still working for Bitcoin. Like that's still a misconception, even though these terms are now known, they're now m more widespread. You can talk to your Uber driver and they actually kind of somewhat understand the, the you know industry you live in. But, you know, we, we need to actually, in the Ethereum community is actually one of the, the more valuable places where when we get into smart contracts and what they can do, the misconception that, that lives in the world of making money, um, it can actually be seen more. Like I, I, my dad is a doctor and I talk to him a lot of times, and this is kind of moving away from Ethereum for a second, but about um, privacy tokens, um, looking at like Zcash for instance. And when, and when we talk about HIPAA laws and like transfer of data and all the issues there, he's a Luddite and he doesn't really understand tech at all, but that concept to him is really cool. And he goes, oh my gosh, you could do that. And that's reaching someone that probably in his lifetime is never going to actually interact with this technology this way, but he can conceptualize it. That's when we remove the misconceptions of it just being at attached to scams and, and you know pyramid schemes or whatever, and we move it into a new layer that's actually usable and functional and people can understand. So just a uh, funny story, like the game company, all of our parents and grandparents are playing this tech demo, right? And they didn't need us to onboard them. They just figured it out. So I think that we're there is the, is the thing we have. Like I know people are worried about scalability, but I really believe that with some of the solutions that have been put forward, like either it be Loom Network or similar side chain, or there's, there's plenty floating around, but I think we're ready. And that's kind of why I launched the game company when I did about a year ago, is because I saw it and I was like, let's do this. After uh, seeing all the friction over the past six years in just the, the puzzle making and the interactive games I had done, um, I, could, I, could, I just realized that those were all gone now. So when we talk about um, onboarding the next million, <clears throat> I'm actually really excited. And I wanted to learn more about earn.com because you're teaching about gamer, like people through, I guess they earn crypto through learning about crypto? Yeah, uh, so you can spend a little bit of your time um, doing a task and then get paid. Um, and so initially it was sort of paid email. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so. I mean, um, do you have, I guess, what's your traction been like with your users? Um, well, uh, so, so we actually sold the company to Coinbase last year. Um, and so, uh, but the, the concept of it uh, was initially sort of around paid email. Um, and then, you know, if you think about res replying to an email is really just one way you can deploy a few minutes of your time, right? Sort of the most common form of micro work that we all do, uh, but it's largely uncompensated, right? Um, then, uh, then there are all sorts of other ways that you could deploy a few minutes of your time, right? Take a survey, um, download an app, right? Uh, basically commission these micro actions from virtually anyone on the internet and then pay them for it instantaneously. Um, and so I think that that, um, that uh, started off with paid email, which resonated with a lot of people, but um, sort of this concept of selling micro increments of your time, I think is really interesting because everyone has free time, no matter how important you are, uh, but you have, everyone has free time and it's a resource that refreshes naturally every day, right? And it's something which is um, largely unmonetized uh, by everyone out there, right? And those are the kind of pockets which I think are quite interesting when it comes to the ability for cryptocurrency to help make a market in that, because now you can basically directly in exchange in exchange for those resources. So not unlike you know what's happening right now, where proof of work mining is essentially flowing to all this latent industrial resource, you know the unused steel power plant sitting in northwestern Texas or something like that, um, which is now coming online because they're sort of a, an extremely low cost miner of Bitcoin. And I think that's broadly something that can be applied in different areas of crypto as well. I think you touched on something I'm really passionate about, mm -hmm. which is um, communities that are high tech, but also high poverty. And how do we get crypto into their hands? They don't mm -hmm. have a bank account. Like, what's yeah. their onboarding experience yeah. like? I was telling Emily earlier, um, I remember my early days in Shapeshift and how amazing that was. I didn't need an account and like I could trade yeah. my crypto. Yeah. And you can do this with non-fungible tokens, for example, still, because they're treated as a commodity. So I could enter the game, just use my time in uh -huh. the game, then I can trade that for my first, uh, my first crypto, yep. and I never needed to give up any personal information in that way. Yeah. 
So uh, to me, you know, one thing that um, I've always thought is really interesting about cryptocurrency is um, really the ability for this money to be, you can pay out anyone, anytime, in any amount, right? You don't have to go, you know, trudge down to a bank, set up a bank account, have government ID in order to, you know, this, this whole sign-up process for fiat bank accounts is actually pretty weighty, even here where it's, you know, considered fairly efficient. Um, and so with that, you can basically sort of um, more easily create a number of different markets that didn't previously exist, right? So for example, around increments of your time. For example, I've been thinking about risk markets, for example, because risk is also something which is, you could call a digitally native asset, which is sort of what everyone has and doesn't really sort of directly monetize today. Gaming could be another, right? So those are the types of markets that I think are, are sort of crypto native, if you will. So, and on that, as we go through things and understand how Earn.com and the gaming industry is introducing us to all these new concepts, I think in the back of a lot of users' minds is the legal implications of entering this new space and having new ownership of something they're not familiar with. So from your perspective, what's, um, what's the approach you're using to get users comfortable with entering into potentially a framework for, for legal and taxes and all other elements that they're not familiar with? I could start. Um, you know, we, we've been focusing a lot in the last year or so of just really getting a good content program together because but coming from this financial side and trying to create a product that's more of an ease of use product, we need to educate and we, we understand that if we have layers of how we're reaching and communicating to the customer, one of those layers actually has to be to educate them on how they're doing storage, how are they being safe, um, you brought up several times about the terminology. Taking some of the terms that we typically use that are kind of scary, like you know, security and flipping that and using a word safety. Trying to find different ways so that you can also remove the fear factor of how we're actually talking to the customer. So we have been rolling out a lot of really fun content so that we can bring them in through those layers, knowing that customer they might not become an actual customer of ours for six months to a year, but we want to bring them along that path and hold their hand a little bit versus like throwing it in their face and hoping they'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, so that for me has been a big part of my journey as well as an individual of someone who didn't know anything about this space. And I had to work so hard when I got in in 2014 to just educate myself. And it wasn't really accessible online. It wasn't something I could go in a hole and just dig around. I had to meet people feel very vulnerable to ask them for help. And we want to make sure that that's something that they can take in that timeline into their own hands. So that's very important, at least for shapeshift coming from the side where we're actually creating financial services. Um, I think that uh, uh, in the US, um, the uh, regulatory frameworks are still being figured out. And right now it's a little bit of, uh, of a situation where folks are uh, regulating through enforcement. Um, rather than having clear guidelines. And my hope is that that's going to be, and I think that, that will be uh, clarified um, over the next couple of years, which is gonna be good for the industry. Um, that said, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not you know, uh, an expert on this topic, but my kind of feeling is that uh, the sort of accredited investor framework is gonna remain sacrosanct, uh, which means that, uh, which means that you know, largely a lot of the stuff, uh, to the extent it's gonna be considered a security, um, is going to mostly sort of continue to be accessible to that, you know, 1% of the population, which is an accredited investor. Um, and that means that I think in America, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the access to this, to this stuff um, is going to be through, you know, security token platforms, compliant token offerings, so on and so forth. Um, and actually the sort of broader based access to crypto native assets is probably gonna take place outside of the United States um, where there's kind of less adherence to um, this, uh, this principle of the credit investor framework. We have no plans of, of doing any of that. So the goal of status is to kind of create this self-sovereignty. And so, yeah, it's not something that we're dealing with in the short or medium term. I think that's a really good point because we often look at what's just even being built in the space at a high level as oh, it, it has to have some element of ownership and I have to own some crypto to be involved. So projects like yours and, and the gaming industry that introduce us to how do I play around with this new technology and get just introduced without having to, to jump in a way I'm not comfortable with are really important. 
I also think uh, the opportunity to onboard with time and to not have to put in money means right. that, like, but currently today, a lot of your blockchain games require you to even experience the game. You have to put in some sort of, like, money in some sense. And for, I haven't even played all the blockchain games because I'm like, I don't really want to go play this crappy blockchain game and, you know what I mean, spend my ETH on it. Um, so the opportunity to interact with an application and then have a normal freemium model where, oh, I can optimize my experience, I can speed up time uh, with consumables, or I can, you know, get a cool skin. Um, those then feel safe. That feels like a safe transaction because you're enjoying the application. It already has value in your in their, in entertainment value. Um, so that, that to me feels safe and like something that users uh, will spend time without realizing it's a, I guess, a valuable uh, commodity. Yeah, I, um, I agree with that. I think that um, also if you think about this from the perspective of creating a good consumer experience, um, the next million uh, probably shouldn't uh, or, or probably won't come from, you know, putting money in and then buying, getting crypto out, right? Because if you think about that, um, I think people generally are risk averse, which is why the insurance industry is as large as it is. It's just a facet of sort of, you know, your average human, or a human out there. So therefore, when crypto goes up, people are happy, but when crypto goes down, people are really unhappy, right? So your expected consumer sentiment with this type of volatility is actually negative, which is inherently unscalable if you're asking people to sort of onboard into crypto by putting money in. Um, and so that's why I think by, necess by necessity, the next million, hundred million have to come through putting their time in, monetizing these kind of, you know, digital, digital resources that are not currently monetized today. And that's where I think this really sort of has infinite potential. There's also the idea of trust lines. So you get trust from friends or from the network, at which point when you feel comfortable with the network, you can start to repay that trust line and then go pay that forward. Um, and also on the stability side of things, I think... DAI and other stable coins have a very significant role to play in this ecosystem purely because the volatility is what is, you know, is what's scaring people from the utility of cryptocurrencies. And so even the concept of DAI is very confusing and the concept of a stable coin also confusing. How can we communicate this thing that is not going to go up or down? It's basically a dollar, but a digital version. Like th this would change billions of people's lives if they knew about it. And even with the current experience, you could still change billions of people's lives. But we, it's very hard to explain that to end consumers. So uh, coming up on the end here to wrap up, um, it'd be great if we could hear a few words from each of you on what you're most excited about in this next iteration and uh, what kind of message you would give new users who are considering approaching a new application um, to, to help them make that jump into the space and, and start participating. Oh, what you're most excited about in the next iteration uh, this year? I'm really excited about all of us taking all the really hard, under the hood, technological work we've been doing and bringing it and creating really beautiful user, user experiences um, that they can actually function with that to Marguerite's point earlier, getting into familiarity. We need to create an environment that they're already familiar with and, and moving that through and seeing how that looks in the next year. I think that would be really cool to see what projects start to really attach to that and, and what comes out the uh, other side. Um, I'm excited to see um, more uh, applications and consumer experiences um, that, uh, uh, that kind of have the potential to appeal to millions of people, right? And I think we're seeing some of that, I would say, much of that is um, focused around gaming, both the gambling side of gaming as well as kind of the more online games um, types of uh, gaming. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what evolves from there. Um, I guess everyone's mentioned user experience application. So I'm excited about that as well as um, us getting to scalability. So if 100,000 people join status tomorrow, everything would break. So solving that is a big deal, and obviously we're investing in that. So that's looking forward to. And in, in terms of recommendations, um, mine would be for you know developers building on this platform to think about utilities beyond what people in this room, and even more so beyond Western Europe, North America. So what are some experiences and utilities you can create for people who are actually in need of this technology, rather than like oh, it's like the next cool thing for us to develop on. 
So um, I've been working, I think I failed to mention this, but I've been working on a major title called Neon District. It's a cyberpunk RPG, and it's very much like a Final Fantasy classic turn-based experience. Um, so that we've had that in development since last January 2018, and the tech stack is done, right? It's developed. And so we're now hooking everything up, and we'll be rolling out the tutorial campaign on like May 1st. And we're just putting out on the 20th, I think, publicly a first look at the gameplay. So I'm really excited because we've been putting in so much work. I mean, if anyone's ever made a game, it is a giant Everest to uh, tie together the art and the tech and the game economy and create basically this giant enigma of something where players could possibly pull out value from for their time. So to see that in the wild, I think it's going to just make my year, obviously. Um, so yeah, that's all. Great, well, thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing the next million. <laughs>